Hi, good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Janan Batur, and I'm the curator of live programs here at Nottingham Contemporary. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this season's presentation with Aberrant Architecture on how we can rethink our ideas around play and adopt a playful attitude to everything we do. Uh, imagining play as a way of being in the world, Aberrant's design blends some of the characteristics of play into all our non-play activities such as work, shopping, or education. Using the power of playfulness, Aberrant believes we can transform buildings and reanimate public spaces to add to the life of cities, inviting people of all ages to use these ex ex existing places in imaginative new ways. For those of you who are with us for the first time, we often invite artists, thinkers, and scholars to collaborate with us uh, on opening up our curatorial research and programs and artistic propositions within our current exhibitions. These interventions and subversions, subversions of dominant modes of thought allow us to develop on complex questions and eventually invent new methodologies for rewriting the artistic canon and the dominant historiographies and for making critical thought public. Before introducing our guests, uh, I would like to share a brief housekeeping note. Our live programs open up different interventions and propositions within our curatorial research across the organization. And this event expands on our current research trend, Emergency and Emergence, as well as our current series, The Ever Adventure Playground, Architectures of Contemporary Play, of exploratory talks and propositions that investigate uh, processes of play and imagination and their role in built environments. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, show our gratitude to the University of Nottingham, Nottingham Trent University, and Paul Mellon Center for generously and graciously supporting today's event, as well as acknowledging my colleagues, Philippa Douglas, Shannon Charlesworth, Jim Brower, Kate, Catherine Masters, Paul Buttle, Andy Batson, Amelia for making this event possible. I mean, you should have seen this space like 30 minutes ago. I think the list goes more beyond than <laughs> the list that I'm actually counting now. So thank you for everyone who supported us this evening. Um, although we will keep an informal atmosphere throughout the evening, our talks, performances, and screenings seek to create challenging environments where open-mindedness and respect for each other's approaches and perspectives can foster growth. So please be mindful and, uh, and respectful of each other's opinions and views. Although we will keep an informal atmosphere throughout the evening, our talks, performances, um, I just read this, sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, Everant Architect, and um, without further ado, I just would like to introduce our guest um, this evening. Everant Architecture is a multi award winning col uh, collaborative studio of designers, makers, and thinkers. Their projects, whether interactive architecture, interiors, public arts, exhibitions, in, or installations, after new and un unexpected ways of experiencing everyday life. By placing storytelling and research at the heart of their practice, they produce spatial experiences that are both meaningful and beautiful. So without further ado, uh, David and Kevin, I'll let you deliberate. Thank you so much for being with us this evening and accepting our invitation. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for coming um, this Hello. evening. I'm Kevin. This is David. Um, we thought it would be a really good opportunity to start our talk with a film. Next one.
So that film there is actually of the Beacon Shopping Centre in Eastbourne, um, if anyone knows it, uh, which can now boast of a playful landscape um, featuring lots of different activities for visitors to explore as well as discover about the area they live in. And when David and I were putting this presentation together, we went back through our archives, and this was one of our first projects we ever did. And it's kind of no accident that play has been part of our practice from day one. So this is actually a shot of Selfridge's shop window where it's about a year into our practice and we approached Selfridge's and we said we wanted to move the studio into one side um, of their shop window and on the other side was this and this was a collaboration with the street and so we would ask people walking past what they loved or they loathed about their city and we would build what they said. But of course if someone said they enjoyed high-rise towers in the city, but someone said they liked green spaces, we would start to break down what they were seeing. And so it was, became a piece of theatre, and we really enjoyed this. It was kind of a playful interpretation of the street, it was collaborative, and really it set the premise of what was to come. And as we've gone over the years, our practice started in 2010, we've kind of decided that actually we describe ourselves as playful placemakers. I think for us, we reveal authentic stories about places, and we design spaces that inspire people to emotionally connect with their neighborhood and community. And that idea of an emotional connection is really important in our work. And once again, when we went back through the archives, there's a project here called the Tiny Traveling Theatre. So this is for Clerkenwell Design Week, which is a three to four day festival in London. And this structure tells a story about that place. So Clerkenwell actually uh, was one of the first places that had a theater and it was built by a gentleman called Thomas Britton. He built it above his coal shed in his back garden. And so we really thought that was an amazing story to tell about the place and let people discover it for an experience. So we built this structure, this odd looking red thing that uses the narrative to guide its design. So the roof is made from coal scuttles and you can have a intimate experience on the inside where you get to the coal scuttles now become spotlights, but you begin to discover the story about the place so this attitude, we call it a playful attitude, and really it's about our work exploring how we can rethink and our entire idea of play and adopt a playful attitude to everything we do. We imagine play as a way of being in the world, blending some of the characteristics of play into all our non-play activities, such as work, shopping, or education. And this is the journey we're gonna take you on this evening. We're gonna talk about our playful attitude to education, uh, to, um, to shopping, and to galleries. And really, we describe playfulness as, is a, as our superpower. Um, we believe we can transform buildings and reanimate public spaces to add life to cities, inviting people of all ages to use these existing places in imaginative new ways. And quite often, Dave and I would talk about, you know, a, an ambition in a lot of our projects is to conceive them as a series of design layers. And these layers consist of this idea of a playful personality. So the image you see here on your screen is actually of beanbag parachutes designed for a public realm in the RAF Museum. These parachutes were designed in collaboration with the local community over a series of workshops amongst the other objects that are dotted around the public space within the gallery. And very much the idea is that we believe that involving people in the process, there's an emotional durability to the project. People are emotionally connected, invested into something, these projects will last longer because it's a collaborative process. The second image is of a pub piece of public art in Swansea and it celebrates place. Um, Swansea was once the center of the copper industry and had an amazing relationship with Valparaiso in Chile. What you're seeing there is a slice of Valparaiso. On the opposite side is a facade made up of coins that were designed by the local community and this becomes a stage for people to use, which leads to the next layer, which is, is this idea of stage. We often design things and we want people to rift on top of our work. So that structure you see there at the end is, of lower, is in Lower Marsh Market. It, we call it the Roman Market, and it provides market traders an outdoor room, a stage on top to put on performances to talk about their marketplace. Engagement. Up here is another important layer. Most of our projects, we really encourage clients we work with or institutions that we, we design ways to encourage people to be involved. And uh, I, was, I was talking earlier um, about how that 
sometimes means we have to leave, leave um, the institution or the gathering. We sometimes do workshops in pubs, in schools, um, in community centers, where people feel comfortable that they can engage in the process. In the middle, another layer. This has become more recent, so this idea of sustainability. That is the, a Christmas tree we designed for the V&A Museum. It's made from recycled paper and recycled plastic, talking about a time when a lot of that is wasted. So I've been working with really interesting materials such as small plastics and rich light to see how we can kind of embed sustainability into our work. And finally, inclusiveness. This idea we don't want to design spaces for just one type of person. We want to design spaces that have a range of activities and considers different body forms so that people and all different types of people can enjoy these spaces as much as we do. So I'm going to hand over to David now and we're going to go a bit back and forth, take you through in a bit more detail, our idea of an attitude, a playful attitude to education, to galleries, and to shopping. Hello. Um, so I'm going to kick off um, looking at our playful attitude to education. Um, and actually, I'm going to start by talking about a project that is not one of ours. Um, but I thought it might be interesting to revisit this piece of research that we did in the context of the... Um, Nottingham Contemporary and the, the show that you currently have on called School of Tomorrow, which um, is revisiting um, some of the work of the Italian-Brazilian architect Lino Bobardi. Um, and back in uh, 2012, we did a big research project looking at another school project by a famous Brazilian architect. This one is Oscar Niemeyer. Um, and he designed um, a school called the CIEPS in the 1980s. Um, you can see a picture of it on screen. Um, and what was really, what we found fascinating about this project is that it wasn't just an architectural proposal, but it was a collaboration with um, a, an expert in school curriculum called uh, Darcy Ibero and a politician called Lino Brazola. And they collaborated to, to create this whole um, combined program of architecture and curriculum that really explored ideas that were far ahead of their time, such as wellness and nutrition and how curriculum can link to architectural space. So the um, project was um, part of a uh, commission that we won um, as part of the British Pavilion um, in the 2012 Venice Architecture Biennale. Um, this is a shot of the, the pavilion from that year. And part of our, um, our commission was we were able to actually travel to, to Rio de Janeiro to research and investigate these schools um, and bring that kind of research back to, to, to Venice, to the pavilion, and to share what we found. So this is a, um, a shot of our um, research wall where it kind of captures some of the photography, some of the videos, some of the information that we discovered about the, um, the schools. And what we found really fascinating about these schools is that there weren't just one that was built, there was 508 of these schools that were built from a, a repeated design that was built all over the city and the state of Rio de Janeiro, which is an area the size of Wales. And you get these schools in city locations, like the one on screen, also in favelas, um, where often it's the only professionally designed piece of architecture surrounded by informal dwellings. Also um, in, in hillside locations, and these schools would also feature, you know, incredible facilities such as um, outdoor swimming pools. But also, very interestingly, many of them had little houses on their roofs where, where children who um, perhaps didn't have the best um, situation at home would actually be living in the, in the schools with, uh, with uh, carers and were provided with this 24-hour kind of curriculum, which is really amazing. Um, this... Um, drawing just kind of gives you, starts to give you an idea of the scale of the project. So the little blue uh, bits are a different school. So you can see the big spike of numbers in the middle there, that's, that's Rio de Janeiro, the city. Uh, and then you can see how they're distributed around the state. Um, and in order to do this, they, they created this factory of schools where all the different components for the schools were made and quickly distributed so that they could make them. So we actually made our own little factory and made a model 
um, for, for, the, for the Biennale of each of the individual schools out of a mold, and we used that to create an installation that we, um, that we shared in the British Pavilion, where we had a model that represented each of the schools that were made, which were labeled with the name and location, just so people could really understand what it, the ambition of a project that's kind of delivering 508 schools over a period of eight years that really started to transform lives. We actually um, got so much research information from, from the project that we didn't get to share at, at the Biennale that subsequently we actually published a book about the project, um, which is available on Amazon, little plug. Um, and the book itself can be sort of understood almost like a, a documentary. So we, um, we looked at interviewing different people involved with the project to get different perspectives. So we interviewed uh, people who were involved with generating the curriculum at the time. We interviewed um, uh, Oscar Nehemiah's right-hand man who was responsible for, for the design. We interviewed um, some of the original teachers. We interviewed some of the children who went to the school at the time. We interviewed the, the head of the, um, the heritage in Rio City. We interviewed the Secretary of State for Education to get these kind of different perspectives on, on the project. Um, but I think the perspective that was most important is from the actual students themselves. So we did a series of workshops where um, we, we tried to, to kind of find out, you know, what they thought about their schools and, you know, simple tasks like getting them to draw their favorite spaces. And consistently what came out that they really loved was the playground and the kind of areas that they could play in the school. Um, and the playgrounds themselves, they featured quite a lot of things that you would find in normal playgrounds, such as goalposts for people to play um, football, for example. But there were also areas with different levels, with steps that invite a more informal type of occupation or a type informal type of play. Um, there was covered areas where children could um, play when it was too hot or when it was raining. But also what really was, we found inspiring is how the architecture started to suggest other uses or invitations for children to you know, have a game of penalty shootout, for example. And I think these sort of ideas at the time are things that we've subsequently built on. Um, what is also really quite amazing is that this idea of a playground was actually pulled straight through into the interior of the school itself. So rather than have staircases separating the floors, there was big ramps that would connect the ground and the first floor. And at, at, at break time, you'd see kids running around actually using these circulation areas as slides. And they, you know, they were very keen when we were there to demonstrate you know, how they would actually run around and slide and, 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 and that kind of sense of embedding play or inviting play into all these areas of the school, I think is, is a, it was really very interesting. Um, also, in the interiors of the corridors, they became, they, they were wide enough that they were areas where children could, could actually paint and, and display their work. So it, it became almost like a, a canvas that, you know, that it invited people to, to respond to. That kind of idea extended to the, to the public realm. So you can see these simple concrete uh, geometric shapes in the landscape where, again, just giving enough to suggest you know, how someone could respond to it and start to play. Um, and also love this picture on the right of, this is actually the, the sign for the school, but just how a little girl is sort of occupied the, the, the area underneath and created a little sort of home um, for the day within the kind of larger scale. And, and, and all of these ideas, I think, um, have become you know, really uh, influential for us. And then lastly, looking at how simple um, pieces of furniture in the landscape. So this is a table, a concrete table that's sized so that you can use it for table tennis, but also it becomes a platform for, for, for to invite children to use in different ways. So you can see how they're just you know, using it to relax or jump off. And that, this idea of just providing enough of an invitation for, for people to then respond, like Kevin was mentioning earlier, almost like a stage or as a kind of, as a prompt, is something that we found you know, incredibly interesting. Um, as well as just being, as well as the playgrounds and the play areas being a place for children to play, what we 
found really interesting is that the SIEPs themselves were very much centers of the community. So this is um, uh, a couple of pages from, from our book where we've illustrated some of the other activities that happened in the school. So rather, rather than in opposite to perhaps schools in the UK, which increasingly become like fortresses that have fences and try to keep people out, the ethos of this project was to really to invite the community in. So all these play spaces became places where the community could come together for different events. So in the top right, you'll see that actually people got married in these schools and still do. And so the, 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 the areas become places for weddings, but also for adult education classes, Kaipuera, or just Samba schools. Um, subsequently, you know, being inspired by, by these uses of, of, of public space and schools in, in Rio and Brazil, we, um, we returned uh, a few times uh, to, to further investigate um, this. Um, so th what we, um, and we took um, on two occasions a group of students from, a uh, group of our students that we taught at Central St. Martins um, to Rio for a series of two week workshops where we, um, in collaboration with a local university, we, we explored the potential for, you know, how could we could design furniture or insertions that could really start to animate further these, um, these public spaces. So what you can see on screen is a group of students as part of the two-week workshop, um, designing and quickly testing at scale. This is part of a, um, a table slash seat design. Um, and you can see, the idea was that it's a, it's a table with a, a series of seat portions that can be pushed together to create a table or taken apart to become individual seats. Um, these were rapidly designed and tested, so we actually produced full one-to-one -one prototypes of these designs. So you can see here the seats themselves are able to rock, so they can the, the, the children can can play with them and um, you know both either sit on them individually or kind of use them to rock back and forth. But they can also put them together to create tables um, in the public space, but can also, you know, again, invite different uses, such as tunnels that go around or people can stand on the top. Um, another aspect that we looked at as part of this project is how can we look at, you know, quite mundane, everyday features of these public spaces, such as railings and produce a series of interventions that, again, can start to catalyze activity. So what you can see here is a, a proposal for a structure that sits on top of the, of the railings, which on the one side provides a seat, um, but on the rear then starts to provide an area where, where children can climb up between the different levels and start to explore in a, in a different way. Uh, this project, um, this particular one, was subsequently taken on by the, the local um, University in Rio and, and developed into a full kind of working um, prototype that subsequently um, won a design award. Then we came back to London and we had the opportunity to work with a school in East London, just in de Beauvoir. Um, and this is Rosemary Works School. And this is um, the existing classroom, one of them. And the school. They, you know, they were kind of talking to us about the work we'd done in Brazil, um, and we got the opportunity to begin to test, I guess, some of those ideas David was mentioning at a slightly larger scale on a very tiny budget. And the focus of this project became very much about collaboration. So we ran a lot of workshops, taking that inspiration from the CEP. So we did a workshop with parents, workshop with students, workshop with the directors, workshop with teachers, assistant teachers. And we kept on doing these workshops because we wanted to get everyone's vision for the school. And lots of drawings were produced, and here are some of our favorites. Um, this one begins to talk about how Rosen works, and particularly the students wanted to move away from rows of tables and chairs, and they started to see their classroom as a landscape where they could begin to have different territories for things they wanted to learn. Um, this is what's been expressed here, which we thought was really fascinating. Similarly, children were drawing kind of, we call them like little nooks or little escape zones away from adults, so we very much wanted to provide them that. Um, as well as 
Um, there were drawings like this, which were talking about fabrics or tent-like structures. Uh, one of the things that we learned from the students was that one of the, a lot of the activities uh, would happen in the same space. So the school hall would be the breakfast club, art club, dinner club, lunch club, PE. And the children wanted to be able to change that environment. So this idea of sort of tents was really interesting to us. We also um, found this image in their, the, the school's library. It's from a book that talks about Edwardian interior architecture. Once again, this image really talks about this idea of territory, the territory on the wall. So the Edwardians had a kind of very sophisticated uh, way of using wall surfaces. The top bit, which was known as the frieze, a bespoke drawing about the room, then a middle section and a bottom section giving two environments, so one when you're seated, you get a different feel for the space to one when you're standing up. The dado rail protects the wall and the expensive materials put on the wall. And we thought this was a really interesting um, observation about Edwardian interiors against this idea of children conceiving their classroom as also bits of territory that they could access. So we took all that and we translated it into this. Um, and you can see on the wall there, we begin to kind of use that idea of territory. So we have that at the top. That was uh, when it first opened the classroom, but it's a, a plywood frieze where they could add drawings to the room over the year and celebrate children's work. The, in the middle was the, um, the section for the teachers. They could access everything they needed, and the bottom was the uh, children's zone. The, the, the classroom moved away from loads of tables and chairs in rows and into the idea of a landscape, different territories that children could go and access. And these were kind of experimental classrooms to see what would happen. I think the other thing to mention is this idea of color. Um, and so each classroom had a different color scheme. On the one hand, that really helped children, children orient, orientate themselves around the school. So new children come in, I'm in the blue and pink classroom, I'm in the yellow class, classroom, etc. Once again, it also reacted to light. So we discovered when we looked more into the, that book by the, uh, about in Edwardian's interior architecture that actually there's a relationship between how you use color and when you have lots of it, you could be uh, much more complementary, and when you have less of it, you can be more exaggerated. So we tried to, once again, begin to thread all these things together and begin to tell a story about the history of the building, the, the occupants in it, and some of our own kind of research into play. And this is um, one of our favorite images. It's, it is of one of those nooks. Um, actually, it's, a, it's a, a canal barge. The actual school's right by a canal. So we built a fleet of mobile barges for, for the children that they could only access. And they used to use these as kind of informal, impromptu theater zones, and they would perform to each other. And then the idea of fabric um, became a really great idea we used in the uh, school hall. So on the right, um, you'll see the children eating. On the left, this is kind of being set up uh, for breakfast club. But there was two rails. One rail had a sheer curtain, one rail had a solid curtain. And the idea was they could just move the curtains to kind of recreate the space to change it for different activities. So you can see here it's set up for PE. On the right, it's set up for reading club. So um, now we're going to take a look at our playfulality to galleries. Um, and I think the best um, project for us to explore this is a commission that we um, were awarded a a few years ago um, in Matadero in Madrid. Um, so Matadero is a, uh, a cultural institution in Madrid um, that occupies a former um, abattoir site. Um, and they've been very interested in this idea um, of the potential of galleries and museums to be more than just galleries and museums. How can they start to become places for play places that invite play. Um, and they invited us as part of their program to, to respond to that and come up with a commission for, for their spaces. Um, as part of their research, they've been looking at um, Madrid itself and trying to identify the different areas and the different types of spaces that encourage play in the city. Um, and together we formulated this idea of how could we perhaps encourage a play space or invite play within a gallery or an institution itself. Um, building on you know, our previous um, interests in projects like the SIEPs that invite play in a, in a, in a 
unprescribed way. Um, and, and inspired by images like this, where you can see you know, existing or everyday parts of the public realm or the, you know, the cityscape being appropriated by children to kind of create play opportunities, um, led us to, um, obviously, in many ways, to Alder van Eyck. So for those of you um, who don't know, Alder van Eyck is a Dutch architect who um, is very much the expert and has built an amazing se um, series of playground projects um, in Holland um, after the war that really look to embed play opportunities within the cityscape and in, in the public realm. And as part of this commission, um, we, we, we took a real deep dive into his work and really started to interrogate all the ingredients and all of the, the, the thinking and the concepts that went into generating his playscapes. Um, and created, this is one of the drawings that we created, almost like a research collage that starts to unpick some of the, some of the things, um, just to pick out a couple of aspects of this architectural vocabulary. So firstly, um, he was a big believer in using um, quite minimalist geometric shapes that, again, this idea of not being overly prescriptive, but just suggest um, enough so that children can respond in their own mind to their, and create their own playful um, characters or playful stories um, and not be overly pres prescriptive. Um, also, this idea of, of, of surface relationships, of playing with surfaces, again, to create territories or different thresholds. Um, in, in, a, in a similar way to what Kevin was talking about in Rosemary Works, that was going on on the, on the walls, um, but looking at the sort of the horizontal on the surfaces. Um, and also, again, this idea of, of, of territory, so having objects that have an impact on, on, on their surroundings. So taking all these sort of this research and building on some of our interests from previous projects, we came up for this proposal for a giant landscape that would occupy one of the main spaces of the institution. So this is the, the plan um, for a project that was, or that we called Landscape for Play, essentially a landscape to encourage play, that in, in had, had this big surface that incorporated different areas, different shapes, that would really invite people to, to play. So this is what it looked like in, re, in actualized so you can see massive structure, massive landscape within one of the big spaces where this big surface was constructed. Um, on the edge of the surface, you can see we designed a number of steps, building on you know, some of the ideas that we saw in the, in, the, in the steps, where steps can be a really interesting way of simply providing seating opportunities, um, but also social opportunities, areas perhaps for parents to sit and, and have a conversation whilst their, their children are running around playing. You can see um, various different surfaces that are separated and demarcated with color. So building on those ideas that we've looked at before, how we can use color to create different territories. Um, and then a series of structures that are populated on the landscape, which again, are quite geometric, don't, aren't overly prescriptive, but start to suggest how people might use them and respond to them. So just to kind of run through a couple, so on the left, um, these are stepping stone structures that um, different people, like children, could use as stepping stones, but also people use them as seats or tables or places to socialize. And again, this wasn't just a landscape, this wasn't a playground just for children, this is for people of all ages. So it was a really interesting kind of experiment in a way to see how different people interacted with it. On the right, we designed a series of sunken rooms. So again, just simply inserting round shapes and, and, and extruding them down into the structure. So again, creating these little territories that people, and little moments that you know, children or people of all ages could start to occupy. And just to say, I mean, this, this, this um, installation, it occupied the, um, the space, I think, for six months. It might have been even extended a little bit because it was just so successful. 
at the, in the area itself, there was a real lack of, of play spaces and certainly play spaces that offered shade. So I, I can't remember the exact figures. I think it was almost like 40,000, 80,000 80, mm -hmm. in the first month. month. Um, I think it was, I think they said it was, it, if not in the top three, maybe even the best kind of attended uh, installation they've ever had. So it was really fantastic to see the kind of the response. Um, again, we, we looked at um, some of the sort of ideas that Aldo and I could looked at, sort of these sort of mountain structures with different levels that allowed people, children, to investigate on their own terms. And also little nook structures, again, bringing some of these ideas through that we'd explored in previous projects, such as Rosemary Works, reducing the scale so that you know, children could get inside and create their own little worlds. Um, and the shape of these structures, this is the structure outside, again, using this idea of quite simple geometric shapes, in this case, a hexagon, so to basically just spark enough in, the, in a child's imagination so they can fill in the gaps. So a shape you know, might become a castle, or the doorway might become an entry to you know, their own house. And I think that's something that really inspires us in our work, is just giving enough of a design and allowing people then to kind of riff on that and sort of fill in the gaps and respond. Um, Again, just looking at the, the, the landscape with the, with the surface and how we've used color to start to create these different territories. Again, it starts to be areas that people can play with, so they became almost like people could, kids would, would create their own hopscotch games and sort of interact with the colors and the territories. But like I said earlier, it wasn't just for, for children. So it was amazing to see how local, for example, theater groups, and um, responded to the space, and they approached um, Matadero and were like, you know, we'd love to kind of put on shows here. So what you're seeing is an actual performance by a local theater group who created a show that responded to the, to the landscape and, and, and used the different areas to put on different parts of their, um, their performance. And then on the periphery, you had the audience sitting on the steps who would move around and watch them. And here you can see, again, parts of that, that performance where, where the choir are situated on, 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 on the landscape itself and people are occupying around. So another uh, playful project situated in the gallery is uh, this one. It's called The Storytelling Igloo. It's for Arts Depot, which is a gallery in North London. Um, what you're seeing there is a, a structure made from approximately 200, 250 bricks. Um, each one of those bricks is designed by a different student from a different school in North London. We collaborated with um, four different schools. Um, each color, so the yellow, the yellow bricks are from one school, the greeny blue bricks from another, etc. And uh, I'm going to play you a film that sort of talks about the process. Um, the music you're about to hear the music you're about to hear is uh, written by students responding to the brief um, that we gave them. So this is us going to one of the schools. That was me talking to them about what an architect does very passionately. So one of the things we ask them to do is ask them to draw their favorite place to play. This is the first part of the process. They're all wearing like a, a, a camera on their head. Then the second thing we asked them to do was to model one aspect of that drawing in clay. took that clay object and we showed them SketchUp, a program, how they could begin to model that. We then took them to Westminster University, they had a fabrication lab, and we showed them how we could take the SketchUp model and cut it into some foam. Then we took some Corex and we made these moulds and we placed the blue foam that was cut from the CNC cutter at the bottom, so all the children's designs, 
And then we started to experiment with a material called papercrete. So it's a more sustainable version of concrete that replaces um, part of the mix with paper mache. And this is us at the schools uh, going back to mix up the papercrete. We started to add pigment uh, to the mix, so every school had a different colour. Children got to um, fill their moulds, discover paper creek. Most of the paper for the paper creek came from the school itself. The schools obviously waste a lot of paper. And then the bricks needed to dry. We left the bricks in the school and then we went to collect them all from four different schools and they were taken to the gallery. So some of the bricks had the CNC mould, some of the bricks we put the original clay object into the brick. And then we built the structure. Oh, here we go. I just want to show you, these are some of the outtakes and things that went wrong, like we forgot to put the handbrake on the car, but there's a, I don't know where it is, there's, it snowed, that was it, I wanted to show you this, it snowed halfway through it and we had to go out and get supplies, it was just, it was, it was a very fun project. Um, I don't know why this, this image is not sort of showing properly, but anyway, th this is the sort of end result. Um, what we're trying to show here is the structure, but on the back wall is actually the original drawings, um, all of the, um, the foam molds that were, cre were created. On the other side, there's the structure, and then at the back, the kind of, the way we made the paper create the process of it. And really, the idea was to kind of lay out the exhibition to really reveal that process, and you could watch the film. Also, when you looked at the, um, the structure close up, we actually made these lintels, put the name of the school at the top, um, children could pop their heads through. And it was really amazing to see, you know, obviously children all came to the exhibition um, on the opening and they all came in and they found their brick and uh, it, was, it was just wonderful to see that. Um, this, this isn't how the image is supposed to look, but it's quite cool, I like it. Um, but that's just gonna just see the wall. Um, just going to now finish on the sort of last section of our talk, really, which is going to look at the a playful attitude to shopping. Um, so this is, um, this is going back at the beginning. We played a film of the Beacon Shopping Centre in Eastbourne. Um, and here's some actually historical sort of images of Eastbourne's ideas behind public realm. And actually, the, at the time, they were quite visionary. They actually employed an architect to go around the world and bring back the best examples of uh, public realm and... Eastbourne effectively is the, was divided into four hamlets, four villages, and each village um, that you can see in, in these images had a different kind of architecture, they had a different kind of approach to the public space, featuring different ways you could occupy it, different types of structures. That really inspired us, this idea that you, you, know, you, could, you could visit different parts of Eastbourne and get a very um, different experience. 
And also, this image here is showing the Eastbourne uh, River. It used to have a river. It was founded upon a river, the River Burn. They're actually burying the river here. And quite nicely, that river actually ran underneath the shopping center where our project was. So we decided to resurrect that idea of a river, but now that river is going to run through the shopping center, sort of weave its way through, and it's going to create four different hamlets, those hamlets from the past. So you had sea houses, Meads, Bourne, and um, South Bourne. So we wanted people to kind of experience the, the origins of Eastbourne, but also the different uh, villages, the different hamlets. Other inspiration came from the fact that we looked at old posters, really enjoyed the sort of color and the graphics. We wanted to bring that through. And finally, um, George Orwell, he went to school in Eastbourne. He wrote Animal Farm. It's said that the actual farm is based on a farm in Eastbourne, so we thought that would be an amazing opportunity to weave all this together to create this playful landscape, but most importantly, inside a shopping center. Um, this, <laughs> this image, again, has sort of gone a bit weird, but you can sort of just make out that this is actually one of the entrances to the shopping center where you're greeted with this totem chimney structure um, with a horse head on top. Um, it's a, a meeting point, a concierge point for the shopping center. Um, but for us, it was a chance to... This, this actually is uh, inspired. This is a chimney structure looking at the architecture of the hamlet um, born. So we used, we looked at the, the forms and we brought those into the shapes and we played with those shapes. We created spaces for people to lean on, but also we wanted to kind of really ha have, have a lot of fun so people could say, I mean, you often hear it when you walk around Eastbourne Beacon Centre now, I'll meet you by the blue horse head or as you're about to see, the big uh, green uh, pig head. Um, this is a, a social swing. It's the second hamlet. It's uh, Meads. You'll notice they have, they're using inspiration, uh, different colors, different forms, and different play opportunities. So as well as um, three people being able to sit on this swing, we also wanted to introduce activities of traditional seating, but there's plug points, USB points, there's tables to work from. We're really trying to change the way people um, conceive sort of transitional spaces in shopping centers, that you can go there, um, it's an amazing sort of family offer, and shopping becomes secondary. It's actually about the interior public realm offer. Um, this was a local resident, Laura, we met. Um, her daughter um, absolutely loves playing here. Uh, they frequently visit. This is another part of the center. This is um, celebrating uh, Southbourne. You can't see it, but on the front of that structure is a goat's head, um, inspired by Animal Farm again. But there's soft play surfaces um, for children to uh, play on, as well as we started to adapt traditional seating. So there's tunnels, there's greenery, there are places uh, for people to work. And also we introduced on the right, the kind of beginning to introduce into the shopping center was quite challenging, semi-private spaces for people to have these moments. Or as you can see, these children on this net having their own sort of little, little bit of territory, their own little space within, within the public realm. The uh, adorable kids on the left are sitting next to peepholes, so subtle um, play opportunities that can be discovered. And within the vinyl as well, this river that flowed through the shopping center, there are games, there are patterns that could be interpreted. There's even messages about this story that you can read um, along your journey. Um, continuing that idea of sort of semi-private spaces, there's these nooks that take um, inspiration from the forms, from the different um, architecture from the hamlets that create these kind of amazing opportunities, opportunities for people to dwell. And it's really great to see, you know, we, did, we designed this with uh, different seating levels. Some got backrests, some got armrests. We're really trying to encourage um, all of Eastbourne's users um, to use the center. This is the last image we're going to end on. It's one of our favorite images. It's of um, the Sea Houses Hamlet. There's a gigantic chicken at, the, chicken at the back. In the middle, there's a nook, and at the front, there's a bed uh, with a soft netting surface. And really, what's really exciting for us is you know, we've, we've, we've done projects in galleries and, and uh, places like this, these installations, but we're now starting to move into places like shopping centers and high streets, where I think we can have quite an impact on how we begin to conceive these space, spaces and change them up. So I'd just like to say thank you very much. Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, Hi. here we go. Um, thank you so much for this amazing and compelling journey that you've given us uh, into your practice and how you actually utilize and use play in your thinking. And 
I mean, what fascinated me the most is how much you pay attention to the kind of, you know, the protagonists of the spaces that you made. I mean, be it the school children or kind of the residents of the, you know, area that you kind of put, um, uh, push forward or kind of like develop these projects on. And I was wondering, I mean, one thing that was quite, uh, I was quite fascinated by and interested in knowing further is um, what comes first? I mean, like, I mean, I, I'm sure that you have some sort of an idea when you're kind of, you know, investing yourself into the space, but you also do this collective decision making in the process. So I was wondering how do you navigate between these kind of data that you collect through including, you know, like these drawings that children do uh, kind of create and also you also have some archival kind of, you know, research. So I was just wondering how do you navigate between those things, I guess. Um. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely an integral part of our process, and I think you know that 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 period where we're almost discovering as much about a site or about a place as possible, <laughs> and almost trying to create get as many ingredients as possible, uh, is is key for us because it, in many ways. I don't think we can design until we have that material to respond mm. to. And that, you know, by weaving that all together, it almost like the design comes out, if, mm. that, if, if that makes sense. And I think what's a really then key part of our process is designing the, the processes that allow that. Mm. So um, we know we're very interested in, you know, we run co-discovery workshops where it's about working with different groups to help us actually discover these insights. That would be a, that's one part of the process. And then we would follow that up with co-design workshops where, and different projects where we would then take those insights and start to, to develop them. Um, and even, you know, on a lot of projects then there's co-production workshops where, you know, certainly with students and things, we can start to start test those. So I think we, we have a, a suite somehow of different tools that, mm -mm. that we use that we deploy probably on, on different projects depending on the different requirements. Some projects we actually get to um, use all of them. Um, I like the storytelling igloo is quite a nice example, mm -mm. I think, like a microcosm of a project and quite small, but actually we got to pretty much do all of those things. And I think that's why it's quite a nice project as a sort of a a demonstration of maybe a potential of kind of something that we'd like to do more of at a bigger scale. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I would just add that the conversation doesn't stop. So we, we, we don't just do the workshop. We, we really enjoy what we're doing. So we go back a lot. I mean, you can see that clearly yeah, in the videos, yeah. for sure. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And um, I think what begins, begins to happen is that sometimes people in our workshops are worried that their idea might not be included. Mm. But I think when you, when you have the work... Have, keep on having the conversation, what seems to happen is themes start to emerge. So you begin to like group ideas together. And the, so, you know, actually, it's really, it's really amazing to go back at the end and people generally feel like they've got a bit of a, when I was talking at the beginning, like this emotional connection to it because they've been a part of it. So if we were just to stop the conversation after one workshop, I don't think it would be as, as successful. But to continue it and to allow some of that tension coming back at us, hold on, where's my... I mean, one of the children in Rosen Work said to me when I went back to the school, he said, I sketched chocolate rain. Where's the chocolate <laughs> rain? And, I, and I, I was saying to him, oh, yeah, no, chocolate rain's a really, really good idea. And it moved on to colour, became an important thing in his drawing and things like that. So, it, you know, it, it, it's fun. We enjoy it. I guess, like, um, what was quite fascinating about storytelling Iglo as well, I mean, beyond them kind of asking their opinion, amplifying their voices in the creation of the kind of, you know, the sculpture, you also slow down the process almost to kind of like turn it into a skill sharing experience as mm. well. So, I mean, you were talking about CNC, you know, you yeah. were talking about, you know, showing them how to use SketchUp yeah. and you're also like, I mean, showing them how to, you know, create papier mache, but also use, you know, renewable materials. So it really feels like it's a project that in each stage kind of provided something in return to the resident um, or the kind of the person who took partake in, in these projects. And I think that I find quite important in your practice and I feel like it kind of cuts across in many of the projects that you do. Um, 
I guess one question will be about the way you uh, kind of use this idea of like playing, because I mean, of course, there's a differentiation between you no know, play and game. I mean, game being this kind of more a structure where there's these inviting propositions, whilst uh, play is a contentious kind of almost spontaneous mm. pulse. So I guess how much, how do you navigate in between? And also, how do you kind of, when you're especially intersecting in these places like gallery spaces, shopping malls, um, you know, schools and so on and so forth, how do you, I guess, navigate around that? And how do you, how does project manifest itself through these kind of, you know, soft playfulness that you kind of uh, deploy? I think, I think a key part of us for, with, with, with respect to play is this idea of, of being playful and, and mm -hmm. using a, a playful attitude or the idea of play almost as the glue to weave everything together. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, rather than for us to see, you know, somewhere that this is where you go to work or somewhere where you go to study or this is where you go to play or live, it's, we, we, we think that you can use play uh, to kind of join everything else together. So why can't you work in a playful way, or in a playful setting, or why can't you, you know, study, or you know, why can't you play and work at the same time? Um, and I think that's a kind of something that I think is developed over time through through our projects and and, and through our thinking. But it, it, I think increasingly it's it's a very interesting way for us to then approach a project such as an interior of a, a shopping centre and say, well, actually, you know, you've got this amazing public realm that currently there's no animation. It's just, it's just a corridor for people to go from A to B. Mm. But actually, by, by using play, we can use the power of play almost to kind of weave together all these other activities so people can then go there to work go there to hang out, to socialize. We can use play and playful methods to sort of design the project, to involve people in the design of it, also to embed meaning and narrative. So it almost becomes like an exhibition in a way. And, and I think that's what's one of the, I think that's what surprised a lot of people, um, the client side, I think, on that project, is we were convinced that actually people would be really interested in learning more about where they live in Eastbourne. And, you know, we were kind of quite insistent on, you know, okay, we've got all these ref references and things, and I think people would be really interested to know why there is there this animal mm -hmm. head. And, and that was a discussion that we had, and then it ended up, we, you know, we got to a place where we had that interpretation in the floor. So it almost became like a gallery space or like a kind of an exhibition that you can also occupy. And people love it. People like, you know, walk around and say, oh, wow, I didn't realize that, mm. you know, and they kind of, they, and, and it's, it's amazing to engage with people out of, you know, out of bringing that sort of, you know, approach out of the gallery setting and taking it into more everyday settings. And, that, and I think at the start of our practice, that's what we've always been interested in is the sort of how we can elevate the everyday or sort of, um, yeah, and I, 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 I also think um, landscape for play in Madrid and the Beacon Center, what you know, I think we really enjoyed seeing was, yes, it's amazing to see children translate these spaces and come up with different ways to use it and play. But for example, in the Beacon Shopping Center, the slide is probably more popular with adults a lot of the time <laughs> than it is with just children. Or you, in landscape of play, you see how people start to it's almost like in the storytelling igloo, you ask a, um, a child to sketch their favorite place to play, you, and they just do it instantly. And they will start to imagine things and rift on it and things like that. And as we go, get older, it's almost like play is like removed from mm. how we look at the world. And so by bringing it into places like the shopping center, I'm really, I, I love it when I see adults starting to you know, creatively just jump a little bit across the vinyl. And I think those little moments kind of adds value to that day. They sort of change up the way you begin to, the, you know, it opens up the imagination. So, you know, I think, I think that's exciting for us. Yeah, I totally understand it. I mean, I do remember the moment when we opened up our exhibition upstairs and when the first, I mean, we had the preview for school children first and I remember the excitement that they had when they realized that their creation was there. 
but also malls being this kind of contested spaces and mainly used by adults. And then I guess like, you know, your perception changed so much over time that you tend to kind of forget what's in your background and you just focus on where you're going and somehow don't slow down and digest actually what's happening around you. So having those prompts and providing them these interrogations and kind of questioning and also adding the interpretation, which was going to be my question actually, mm. and you answered, I think does give this kind of idea of, you know, this does allow them to immerse in the space and claim their own. And I guess like the moments I see upstairs when the adults are actually playing with the sculptures that we have are always the ones that are quite exciting. I mean, not that I'm disregarding, of course, the <laughs> children and, you know, people that we usually kind of accommodate. But I think this idea of, you know, breaking from or breaking from what you kind of used to and letting yourself go and being able to, like, immerse yourself yeah. into that space is always much more difficult when you're in a, I guess, certain stage. And what you were saying was quite interesting in terms of how to immerse architecture and playfulness uh, you know, in everyday life, which is very much related to Lina Bow's kind of mm. total life practice. How can architecture represent everyday life and how can everyday life represent, be ingrained in the architectural thinking itself? So I guess there's a lot of kind of, you know, overlaps with what you, what we have done, I mean, uh, upstairs and what you have been doing throughout your practice that seems like it's ever unfolding and changing and somehow this playful gesture is always ingrained. And I guess my question will be, um, I guess, yeah, we heard about how things kind of unfolded for you, but we don't know much about, I mean, where everything started, I guess. I mean, how did urban architecture came about? And I know you studied at Royal College of Arts, and maybe you can talk a bit about where this idea came from and how did this idea of playfulness became so ingrained in your practice? Um, yeah, I mean, it, we, we, we studied together at the RCA. Um, it was actually a field trip to Tokyo. Okay. Um, it, I, There's I, a lot of play going on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <I'm just> <laughs> sit, sitting on a ledge. Um, I, I mean, I think, I, think, I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there was, you know, Dave and I went out, you know, you go, you go to the RCA and it's, it was at the time of Nigel Coates and narrative architecture mm. and you know, we've been really encouraged to tell stories through, play, um, through place, and that's already immediately playful. So my first experience of studying the RCA was I, you know, I watched films. I, uh, we didn't look at architectural references. Mm. We were encouraged to seek out narrative. And um, I think that's something that we, Dave and, I, Dave and I had in common, although sometimes our approach was slightly different. Um, so there was... A similar agenda. I think a lot of time it was interactive, social, and playful, especially in the work we were doing at the RCA, and it was encouraged by this um, narrative theme running through the school. And then I think when we left the RCA, I saw some people um, sort of experienced there was a bit of a frustration of not being able to mm -hmm. find a job that really you could do that. And um, I think we, we were lucky enough to win a commission at the VA, the residency, in 2010 and a recession, not knowing how to set up an architecture practice, but we had a bit of time to go there and um, really, really explore that. So that was, that was the origins of it, really. Um, that's how it all started. Yeah, and I, and I think certainly early on, um, we were very lucky enough to get some quite, actually quite small um, temporary commissions, mm -hmm. but they were really probably because they were temporary. They were really good opportunities to do some quite interesting, challenging things, so, you know, such as the, the Red Theatre. Um, we did a, also a blue mobile structure. And, mm. and these almost became like little, little test prototypes or kind of, you know, to sort of... I think one of the things we've always been interested in is we didn't want to be a, a paper practice. So, you know, if as we wanted to kind of to build and, and test mm. and kind of create projects and get them into the public realm and, and see how people respond. And, and what sealed the deal, actually, at the RCA was Dave, David tried to bring bees into the, the college and I tried to bring dogs into the college as part of one of our structures we were designing. So I was like, we definitely have to yeah, do practice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'm conscious of time. We only have 20 minutes left. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's a good time to open uh, up to our audience, yeah. Um, I was kind 
Sorry, hold on a minute. Can you wait for a microphone to be brought to you? Okay. <laughs> There's a race. There's a race. Do you need so. more than one? It's a game. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you if you think that... Sorry, it's not working, I think. <laughs> it's just for the recording and the documentation of it, so that's why. Try. <laughs> Hello? Hello, yeah, well, I think that works. Okay, finally. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you think that play can really truly be facilitated in social spaces in the UK because I found it quite interesting to look at what was going on in Rio and I feel like that wouldn't be possible in our culture of things needing to be like ultra safe and low risk and padded if like children are going to be around it mm. so it's like I don't know just wanted to know what your thoughts would be if, if like culturally the UK could ever get to that space of having the freedom amongst the people? I think we've definitely seen a lot, you know, a massive rise in, in health and safety and, you know, playgrounds over the last, I don't know, 20 years have become, you know, massively overly designed so that, you know, with soft surfaces and various aspects that, you know, really restrict what what a child can do, but I think we're seeing a a movement now and a, and a response to that, and I think people are starting to understand that how we can manage risk a bit uh, a bit better. And also, I think there's starting to be an acknowledgement that you know a, a bit of risk in, and, and, and play is, is really so important to. Um, for, for all of us and certainly for children to kind of to learn. Uh, so I'm not saying that it's going to be like completely sort of dangerous, but there's, there's, there's certain things that you can do that can, it's, it's, it's not, nothing too bad is going to happen. Um, and I think there's, there's projects that are starting to acknowledge that. And I know we've, um, you know, I think, you know, we, in, in our projects, you know, we work with um, health and safety consultants and that, that's conversations that we have about, you know, looking at, okay, you know, we can do this, we can do that. So, and, and, and I think maybe previously or for a long time, I don't think people were necessarily challenging things or, or, or sort of just, you know, they were kind of accepting, okay, that's what you have to do. But actually, if you, if you ask certain questions or try and you, you can actually, I think, find a little bit of sort of wiggle room and, and, and start to maybe do things perhaps not as 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 unrestricted that maybe you find in maybe you know other other countries or other cities who might not have such sort of comprehensive health and safety regulations but I think there's definitely but I, but I also think that I think it's a really good question and I think there is a there is a bit of a cultural difference for sure um, what we saw going on in Rio and I think one of those differences mainly is uh, in the presentation, what Dave was saying is that how the school, the CEP, was seen as the centre of the community which invited people in. And that's why I think we're excited about projects like we're doing in shopping centres. Because I think in the UK, shopping centres, high streets, are, probably have a similar sort of notion. That's the centre. But when you go to those kind of places at the moment, you wouldn't really see the kind of things we're doing in Eastbourne or experimented with. Typically, they're quite similar. And so if we take the notion of the CEP in Brazil inviting different types of activity into a centre, what we're trying to do in places like high streets and shop centres in the Beacon is invite that different activity into there. And then we can build upon that. So, you know, we're now working with shopping centres where, you know, like I said, shopping is slowly starting to be removed and workplaces starting to come in. So you're going to, I think, over the sort of next 10, 15 years, see a real diverse change in high streets and shopping centres. And I think they will become these more playful environments. And so they will become... I think, strong centres again, not just for shopping, but for other uses like we saw in the CEPs. And I would say, actually, one of the things that's probably that we're increasingly taking from the, the CEPs is this idea of how robust uh, 
things need to be in, in, in the public realm so that they can stand up to a real you know, intense use. And I think one of, the, you know, one of the things that we've really observed is that shopping centers and public realm in shopping centers are probably one of the most intensely used spaces that you can get and really attracts a massive cross-section of society. And so just, just looking at you know, projects like the SIEPs where you know, their, their insertions were, I mean, they're very raw, but concrete, incredibly hard wearing, were built to sort of last and, and withstand you know, a really high intensity use. And there's sort of kind of, this, there's lessons like that, I think, that we can start to sort of bring in to, to how we can design these spaces that you know, are incredibly robust so no, it's a, it's a really good point, because at the moment in the Beacon Shopping Centre, the swing is shut, because it's so well used. Um, we now have a new problem, which is if we really want to make these places the centre and people to rift on top and have these activities, what David's saying is right, we've got to make them more robust. That was our first attempt. We learned a lot of lessons. We're going to start doing some other ones. But also, we really want to, uh, with some of our clients, introduce them to like really exciting new materials that we could bring into the domain, like you know, recycled plastics and things that have that, um, that duration um, that's needed. Because um, for a lot of our clients, I think the dilemma is, is that they don't really want to potentially deal with the ongoing maintenance, but at the same time, if we're encouraging more people to use these spaces, is it, it's probably partly our role to think about the robustness of them, so you really encourage activity. We don't want to see the swing closed but at the same time, there probably needs to be some kind of management of it. But, this, but something we're really excited about, if we can involve people in the process, that idea of sort of their, you know, some of their ideas, I think if people become more emotionally connected to these centers, I kind of think that people would also maybe take care of them as well. You, know? you kind of often see with um, guerrilla gardening around cities, people just start to like, you know, do those kind of things naturally. It'd be amazing to see that in a shopping center, like someone coming along just like into like, build something on top of their bench or, I don't know, do something or, you know, becomes their office for, for, for a week or something. That'd be amazing, so, just, yeah. Just to clarify, the swing will be opening soon. Yeah, yeah, it will be, yeah. It's. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Hi. Um, very, very interesting. I like play a lot. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about the process. So you mentioned code discovery and code design. Um, in testing, do you, do you test any early designs? And, and I guess when you are seeing how people, children, adults, interact with those early designs, do you have to change things? And do you have any stories about that, how that's gone before? I think we would, I would say in a, a lot of our projects are almost, I'd say our, our, our work, as, as we do certain projects, are almost like tests. And, and, and it's, you know, as we, as, we, as we do a project, we, um, you know, we're very keen, you know, there's a, there's a brief at the start, and there's a, obviously there's a criteria that we were designed to from a client, um, and, and we work with, with clients to produce these designs, but also it's, it's really important, and, and increasingly this is something that's become much more important in our practice, is after a project is completed, What's the learnings? What's the kind of what's the what's the the lessons? What's the data we can take that we can then use to inform the next project? So that the next project builds on the previous project, and you know, and, and we get all, and we capture all that 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 learning. Um, so wh whereas, well, actually, what I would say that. I don't think we do any. I've done any projects where we've probably done any physical tests with that project, but I'd say there's a, there's a, maybe a, a cross fertilization between, say, for example, landscape for play, it was a, a, a project in a gallery setting, but also an opportunity to do a big test in a in a in a in a, in a, in a, in a say a six month commission for for ideas and approaches which we then applied in a more permanent commission in a shopping centre. So, and I think that for us, that's quite interesting, switching back between projects for in a, in a cultural situation, which you probably have a bit more flexibility 
with regards to regulations, mm -hmm. and, and you know you don't have to deal with necessarily some of the issues, but it'll, they can become these prototypes, these tests, which we can then take mm. and, and apply in you know maybe more commercial settings. So I think there's, there's definitely a, a, a dialogue and a, and, a, and, a, and a give and take between sort of our work in different sectors, and certainly as we kind of do different projects, we're taking what worked well. Um, we're, and we're certainly done doing that from Eastbourne, and we're currently applying some of the lessons to other shopping centers um, around the country. Yeah, so I, I mean, I would just add that I think that last bit there, um, we want to retain relationships with our clients. We very much talk in the beginning, look, we've never designed um, a playscape inside a shopping center. And, and the people we're working with are up for this challenge. So it's very much, you know, so it's a great attitude to work with clients that understand that we might not get it exactly right on day one, but there's a lot of amazing things that are going on that the next one we're doing, we're taking lessons from. Um, so I think that's, I think making sure that the ambition is set up front or spoken about front would really help. Um, and I did have something else, but it's just left my mind. So it'll come back to me in a minute. I mean, who can blame you? It's almost eight, so yeah. it's that time of time. Uh, exactly. Any other questions? I guess I want to know about the process with Matadero, and that was something that I actually want to uh, want to ask you because I was so, I mean, that how the com community itself embraced the whole space and how they came up with their own plays. I mean, like literal sense, you know, within that space. I think it's so amazing, and I was wondering in. I was wondering how you kind of, you were talking about like talking to communities and some agents that were surrounding Matadero to understand exactly what kind of space that they might need or how we can kind of ingrain the ideas of, you know, uh, play while they're actually, actually creating this kind of common space and common ground as well for them. So I was wondering, I guess, like how that process exactly unfolded because it's such a success to see how, you know, they have immersed themselves in the space in very imaginative ways mm -hmm. that you probably haven't even, didn't even consider when you were actually sketching up think, that space, right? I think that's the thing that just reminded me, I was going to say actually, that Great. In, in the, in the Madrid, Madrid project, something we did which we really enjoyed was obviously we stayed there and, mm -hmm. and watched how people use the space. And it happens a lot in all of our projects. There was um, one I always remember as well as the, the blue structure we showed, the Roman market. Mm. And we sort of think about how people could use it. And then what happens is, I remember we saw it in Time Out. It was called the world's um, smallest restaurant. Yeah. And for Valentine's Day, they put a chef on the roof and two lovers dined mm. underneath. Now, that's amazing to see because they're kind of reinterpreting what we're thinking. The same thing happened in Madrid. You sit there, you saw families design their own games on the structure as we're, as we're looking at it. So it's, and I think what we really enjoy is this, unknown what you know what might happen so you i think when david was talking he was talking about you just design enough and then you give it over and so mm -hmm. the, the whole theater thing where theater groups started to come to use it that was completely unknown to us but i think the important thing is we always try and spend time in the projects that we've designed to learn from them Problems will come. Let's not worry about the problems. Let's mm -hmm. embrace those problems and, and then see how we can actually turn those problems into new opportunities to then rift on the next project. Um, but always invite people um, into our spaces to see how they, how they see it. Yeah, and I would add, you know, one thing that we do a lot in our, in our design process um, is create these drawings that we describe as scripted scenarios. Mm -hmm. So we based on our observations, based on our research, we imagine possible ways that we think people could respond to mm -hmm. the invitation and almost like pretty storyboards that show, okay, you know, we, we imagine the space could be used for this type of event or people could do this. And that allows us to kind of think through, okay, okay, we, you know, there's certain prompts that we think could be used, but always without fail, the best uses are things that we just haven't thought about. And I think, yeah, like Kevin said, that's, that's when you know that something's really landed and, and mm -hmm. when you, you, you get these responses and people you know, start to riff and create new and exciting ways 
of, of responding to our, to our work and, and to the place where it's situated. And that, for us, is probably the, the seal of approval. You know, then we know, OK, yeah. we've, we've done a good project. Amazing. I'm just going to look at time. We, have, uh, we can get one last question, if there are any. I think it's a simple question. Uh, so what would be your two kind of favorite place to play? So what would you have drawn and then uh, imprinted on those bricks? Oh, uh, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> actually, I think you know, you've got I that. got the answer, actually. So um, we, um, we did a workshop, and we asked this question to all the participants, and we also did it ourselves. So um, unfortunately for me, uh, I don't have the picture. But um, it's an amazing picture. It is. <laughs> it's a picture of my parents' uh, garden when we were kids, and um, uh, I'm one of four. And looking back, it looks like one of these pictures from the 70s. Not from the 70s, it's from the 80s. But you know, we, we'd made this um, this boat out of found material, like you know, there's an oil drum and there's some bamboo and there's like, some pallets and we constructed this, this, yeah, this boat, and um, I'm the oldest, so I'm the kind of captain, and then my brother and my sisters are kind of on it, and then there's a couple of, I don't even know, some friends of some of my siblings. Um, and I think, you know, that, that, that kind of, again, and that sort of idea of, of creating your own world, you know, taking abstract objects, everyday objects, putting them together, creating your own games, is just something that's, um, you know, really stayed with me personally, and, you know, that's why I showed that picture, um, and that's a really good question, and that's, you know, and I think that's something that, I think we always, you know, we always, when we're designing projects, we always try to go back to, you know, and put ourselves, you know, what would we kind of want to do or think? And, um, and mine was, I'll just say first, I was a good kid, but uh, I used to uh, enjoy, my favorite place to play was where my mum told me I wasn't allowed to play, which was a part of the street, probably the most dangerous part of the street because of cars coming around the corner, but me and my friend used to love playing Kirby on this part of the street because you had the added danger, and um, I guess also because I was told I wasn't allowed to do it in some way. So, um, but yeah, like I said, I was a good kid. <laughs> All right, so I guess that concludes our evening. Thank you so much uh, for accepting our invitation. A round of applause for Kevin and David. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, the, if you want to trace some of the gems that has been shared here today, uh, the recording of tonight's event will be uh, online, hopefully in the next few days. And also, we're concluding our Adventure Playground series with the last event taking place on Wednesday with Gabriella Burkhalter, who has been working on uh, this project titled The Playground Project for almost a decade now. And she's going to be sharing some archival footage of the work that she has been conducting and also the research, but also sharing some films to kind of complement those ideas. So if you're interested, please do jo join us. Again, I mean, thank you so much, Kevin. Thank, thank you. you so much, David. It was so amazing to have you here and you get it, you know, great insight into your practice and have a sense of how much playfulness you know you ingrain yourselves in almost over over a decade now so thank you thank you thank you thank you